Part one. A man is telephoning his local college about a course. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Good morning, City College. Oh, good morning. I'm phoning about the photography course that you run. Well, actually, there are three courses. It depends on your level. One course is for beginners. The second is for people with a little experience. We call that the intermediate course. And the third is an advanced course for people who already know quite a lot about the subject. Oh, I see. Well, I'm quite a keen photographer. But at the moment, it's just a hobby. I want to learn more so that I might be able to do some work professionally at some time. I think the intermediate course would be a bit easy for me. Perhaps the advanced course would be best. When does it start? The advanced course starts on September the eighteenth. Okay, just let me note that down. The eighteenth of September. And how long does the course run for? It's a twelve-week course, but there's a week off in the middle for half term, so you do twelve lessons over thirteen weeks. So, what's the date that the course finishes? It finishes on the fourteenth of December. The fourteenth. Okay, that's quite near Christmas, isn't it? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Can you tell me how much the course costs? Yes, it's ninety-six pounds. Ninety-six? That's not too bad. That's paid in advance, and I'm afraid there's no refund if, for any reason, you can't complete the course. Yes, of course, that's fair. How many people are there usually in the class? I've heard the groups are quite small. Well, we can't say for sure, but there are usually between six and ten people in a group. On the last advanced course, there were seven participants. Oh, good! That sounds perfect. Can I enrol for the course now on the phone? Yes, of course. I'll take your details now, and you can pay by card now or send us a check if you prefer. So, first of all, what's your name? It's Graham Merton. That's M E R T O N. And your address? Flat three, a hundred and nine Chelsea Court. That's in Oxford. Okay. And how old are you? We like to know more or less the age of each group. I'm twenty-eight. Okay, Graham. We'll send confirmation and some course information in the post. Now, how would you like to pay? I'll pay with my card now. Okay, if you can. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to seventeen.
Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Hello, Clark Cycle Hire. My name's Keith. How can I help you? Oh, hello. I saw your ad in the local paper, and as I'm thinking of doing some cycling, I'm wondering what kinds of bike you have and what your prices are like. Well, we hire out two main types of machine, touring and mountain bikes. Are you likely to be riding off-road, do you think? No, I'll probably be sticking to roads and country lanes, so a touring bike would be best, I think. Right, well, the rate will be £50 for a week or £14 per day. So it's a lot cheaper to rent by the week? Yes, definitely, though it's important to bring the bike back on time. Otherwise, I'm afraid we have to charge a late return fee. And how much is that? For each additional hour, it's £1.25. So if you were a day late, it would cost another £30? Yes, that's right. I'd make sure I didn't do that, then. I should also point out there's a deposit which you get back when you return the bicycle. In good condition, of course. On touring models, it's £60. Is there anything else I'd have to pay? No, that's it. Though, if you're planning to ride fairly long distances, you might like to have one or two accessories. Such as? Well, for another £5, we can supply lightweight bags, either panniers or the handlebar sort. It's amazing how much they can carry, and the way they're designed means they don't get in the way when you're riding. Well, I'll see. But what about essential things like a pump and a repair kit? I wouldn't have to pay extra for those, would I? No, no, no. There's no charge for things like that. Or for a lock. It's a good strong one, too. Just make sure you don't lose the key. That reminds me. What about insurance? What happens if someone steals the bike, in spite of the wonderful lock? Didn't I mention that? Oh, I, I should have told you that's included in the rental, too. And it covers everything, does it? Uh, it covers you against theft of the bike, yes, as long as it's securely locked at the time. You'd have to pay part of any individual claim, though. How much? If the bike was stolen and not recovered, you'd be liable for the first £100. Hmm, so if I do go ahead and rent one, how do I pay? By cheque or would it have to be cash? Uh, neither, I'm afraid. We can only accept credit card bookings. Otherwise, we'd have to ask our customers for the full value of the machine as a deposit. I've got a visa in my name. Would that be OK? Sure. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. So if I want to have a look at the bikes, how do I find you? I live near the university, by the way. Right. First you take Woods Road as far as the main police station. I know it. It's right next to the park. Yes, that's it. And after the police station, there's a turning to the right called Oak Street. At the big supermarket? Uh, no, it's before then. It's actually between the police station and a garage on the other side. OK. So, you go down Oak Street until you reach the health centre on the right. If you get to a pub called the Maple Leaf, you've gone too far. All right? Yes, I've got that. Now, opposite the health centre, there's a pharmacy, and we're just behind that. OK, fine. I'll try to call over sometime tomorrow. Great. See you then. Bye. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two students and their tutor discussing a wildlife presentation. First, you will have some time to look at questions 21 to 26.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Hi, Katie. Hi, Ian. Come on in. Hi, Professor Gordon. We wanted to talk to you about our wildlife presentation next week. Have you decided how to organise it? Yes, Professor. At first, we were going to focus on the cat family, but then we decided to talk about nocturnal animals instead. Yes, good idea. And how is your planning going? It's going well. We think we have enough material for 20 minutes. The advantage is that there are so many visual aids we can use. We found lots on the internet which we think will be really interesting for people. The problem is that this topic has been hard to narrow down. If anything, we've got too much information for just 20 minutes. How do you think we could narrow it down further? It is a broad subject. There are a few ways you could do it, but I'd recommend just looking at a representative sample of nocturnal animals, just four or five. Yes, and maybe we could choose one animal from each continent, or a land creature, a marine creature and a winged animal. I like the idea of separating it by different types of animals. And if we limit the detail, we'll definitely have enough time. But don't limit the detail too much. Also, think how you're going to interest the audience. Well, we're going to have a picture for each animal so we can talk through the picture. That's a nice idea, but don't limit yourself to pictures. If you can find any clips of the animals, use them. Showing brief video clips can keep an audience interested. I'll look on the internet tonight. And think of questions to ask your audience. People like to be involved. Yes, that's a great idea. Anyway, Professor, we've been practicing our presentation and we'd like to show you a small section. Is that OK? Well, we just have a couple of minutes left, but go ahead. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Well, we were thinking of presenting each animal with a picture and describing their physical characteristics. OK, but not in too much detail. That's just background information. We'll start with the jaguar. I'll introduce it by saying that the jaguar is a nocturnal animal and the only species of the genus Panthera to be found in the Americas. Like any cat, it has whiskers and it can move quickly. Its spine has great movement, meaning a jaguar can take long strides, sometimes up to five and a half metres. This can make it a deadly predator, as you can imagine. Moving on to the fur, its fur is quite distinct. The markings are like black donut-shaped spots on its otherwise yellow fur. People often confuse them with a leopard for this reason. Now, the tail is interesting. Although people think that the tail has stripes on it, the fur on the tail actually is similar to the body, with black circles around the lower section. The jaguar is generally a creature to be feared. Oh yes, I should have mentioned this earlier. Sorry, like most cats, it has sharp, retractable claws. Yes, that's fine, but be careful. The jaguar is usually thought of as nocturnal, but strictly speaking, it's crepuscular. In other words, most active between dusk and dawn. But as long as you mention this, you can put it under the umbrella of nocturnal. Is that all? Yes, I think so. Thanks, Professor. The end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a man talking on the radio about dogs which help people with their work. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Welcome to this week's edition of Countrywide. And today, we're taking a look at a number of different breeds of working dogs. And here to report on the dogs with jobs is Kevin Thornhill. Thanks, Joanne. Well, yes, dogs with jobs is the subject of today's program. Dogs have earned themselves a reputation over the centuries for being extremely loyal. And here's a little story which illustrates just how loyal they are. Just outside the country town of Gundagai in Australia is a statue built to commemorate a dog. A dog which sat waiting for his owner to return to the spot where he'd left him. Well... The story, which was immortalised in a song, has it that the poor dog died waiting for his master, five miles from Gundagai, which is where they built the statue. Now that's what I call loyalty. Well, because of their loyalty and also their ability to learn practical skills, dogs can be trained to do a number of very valuable jobs. Perhaps the most well-known of working dogs is the Border Collie Sheepdog. Sheepdogs which work in unison with their masters need to be smart and obedient, with a natural ability to herd sheep. Some farmers say that their dogs are so smart that they not only herd sheep, they can count them too. Another much-loved working dog is the guide dog, trained to work with the blind. Guide dogs, usually Labradors, need to be confident enough to lead their owner through traffic and crowds, but they must also be of a gentle nature. It costs a great deal of money to train a dog for this very valuable work, but the guide dog associations in the UK, America and Australia receive no government assistance, so all the money comes from donations. Another common breed of work dog is the German Shepherd. German Shepherds make excellent guard dogs and are also very appropriate as search and rescue dogs, working in disaster zones after earthquakes and avalanches. These dogs must be tough and courageous to cope with the arduous conditions of their work and so that they can be sent anywhere in the world to assist in disaster relief operations, effective dogs and their trainers are now listed on an international database. When you arrive at an airport here, you may be greeted in the baggage hall by a detector dog wearing a little red coat bearing the words quarantine. These dogs are trained to sniff out fresh fruit as well as meat and even live animals hidden in people's bags. In order to be effective, a good detector dog must have an enormous food drive. In other words, they must really love their food. At Sydney Airport, where there are 10 detector dogs working full time, they stop about 80 people a month trying to bring illegal goods into the country. And according to their trainers, they very rarely get it wrong. Another famous working dog is the Husky. Huskies, which originally came from Siberia, have been used for decades as a means of transport on snow, particularly in Antarctica where they have played an important role. Huskies are well adapted to harsh conditions and they enjoy working in a team. But the Huskies have all left Antarctica now because the International Treaty prohibits their use in the territory as they are not native animals. Many people were sad to see the dogs leave Antarctica, as they had been vital to the early expeditions and earned their place in history along with the explorers. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.